Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts called Menninger Mindscape. We have a very interesting guest today, Dr. Chris Ferrico. And Chris is a member of our faculty in the Department of Psychiatry here at Baylor and also in the Department of Pharmacology. And Chris is a research psychologist who's doing some very interesting work studying cannabis or marijuana, and that's um, a fairly hot item in the news these days. It has been, of course, for some time. Uh, Chris is going to be one of the speakers, just to give you a little plug for a, a, a program coming up. We do an annual symposium sponsored by the Department of Psychiatry at Baylor and also jointly sponsored by the Menninger Clinic. Um, we call it Advances in Psychiatry, and this year it's going to be on October 10th. And Chris will be one of our speakers, and the theme of the whole symposium is on addictive behaviors. I think it's going to be very interesting. And he's going to be talking about marijuana and a lot of things that relate to that. And we're going to give a little bit of a, a sort of advanced um, headline session, uh, just talking a little bit about that. So Chris, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing, and then I may jump in and ask some other questions as we go along. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so currently, we're looking at different medications that are FDA approved to see if they can help individuals uh, who are trying to quit using cannabis to um, reduce the withdrawal that has been associated with uh, abstinence and also improve the cognitive functions uh, associated with prolonged cannabis use. Okay, um, that's a lot already. Mm, so uh, <laughs> what I mean is um, it's a controversial area, yes, isn't it? Um, indeed. Yep. So you're saying things as if they're established facts, like cognitive impairment from long use. Sure. So j just talk a little bit about what you see as the concerns about maybe extensive, prolonged, or even uh, excessive mm -hmm. marijuana use. Sure. So I, I uh, apologize for jumping in a little far ahead there. Um, I've been studying cannabinoids for over 20, almost 20 years now, uh, starting in uh, preclinical models and looking how it affected the development of the brain um, in adolescent animals. Um, what we found is that when you repeatedly administer the main psychoactive ingredient uh, of cannabis, which is THC, to animals, uh, you see a change or a impairment of their ability to perform certain cognitive tasks. Uh, these cognitive tasks are dependent uh, uh, on maturation mm -hmm. of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, and that's what makes it significant, mm -hmm. is that this particular region of the brain is what allows us as adults to uh, use critical judgment and to evaluate situations and choose what is going to be most advantageous uh, for us in the future. Right. Uh, and so what this suggests is that by using cannabis or marijuana during adolescence, you can impair the development of this brain region and hence the functions that's associated with this brain region. Uh, well, so let me jump in. So, so are you really mostly focusing on the developing brain, the adolescent brain? Because in, in the literature, there is a fairly common distinction that would argue that there might be significantly more risk in the not yet mature brain, mm -hmm. but that in adults it may not be the same level of risk. Yes. Uh, so I talk most about adolescent brain and the effects on the adolescent brain while I study adults. And the rationale for that is that the vast majority of people begin using cannabis during adolescence. And those who seek treatment for their cannabis use overwhelmingly began to use cannabis heavily during adolescence. Okay. And it is those individuals who are most susceptible, it appears most susceptible, to the adverse effects. Are you, are you trying to compare them with, if you can get people together and be confident that it's accurate information, mm -hmm. users who didn't start till adulthood? Yeah, so th that is something that we would like to do. Um, right now, I'm focusing on just the individuals who began using during adolescence. Um, and once you know, we get those studies up and running, uh, certainly the idea would be to look at the individuals who began using after, the, I'd say, the age 25. Okay. Um, and then try to control for how much they use overall, because there is dose-dependent effects. Uh, the cognitive effects are dose-dependent. Okay. so. 
I recently took a trip and I had to go to a meeting in Denver. <laughs> so I'm in Colorado, and of course it's not just medical marijuana, but it's legalized in that state as well as a couple of others mm -hmm. for recreational use. Yes. I must say I was shocked to look at the local sort of free newspapers and see the whole half of the newspaper devoted to advertisements for marijuana of all kinds. Yeah, and I think that's certainly something to be concerned about. Uh, if I was a parent there, I'm a parent here, but my son's three, you know, I still think about when he gets older. Uh, that is probably not gonna be a good thing uh, as these kids are growing up to have these uh, advertisements uh, inundating them constantly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. We were talking earlier, let me find it here. Um, and I should have got this out. Here it is. Just a few days ago, or at least a few, uh, within the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. there was a whole series of editorials in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times took a position and said that uh, mm -hmm. this headline is repeal prohibition again, mm -hmm. and by which they mean let's legalize marijuana um, for at least um, those 21 years of, old, of age and older. Mm -hmm. So they don't endorse it for adolescents and recognize that there's a risk there. Sure. But they say that um, it's something that should be legalized and would not be justified to continue the illegal status. Mm -hmm. Then there are a whole series of others. One that says what science says about marijuana. Now not everybody agrees with this mm -hmm. and it's a big zone of controversy still. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think? Oh, well, I think it's just that, a simple little question. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very loaded question. I think there's a lot of politics in it, um, and that's unfortunate. And I mean, that dates back over a century, um, and that's where they get repeal prohibition again. Um, but the issue is, is that going to make it more readily available for your kids? And I think that's what people lose sight of. Uh, I don't have any opinion about adults and what they do and you know, we can each make our own decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the children who are the ones who are most vulnerable. And if they see mom and dad drinking alcohol, they're more likely to have a drink when they're younger. If they see mom and dad smoking pot, they're more likely to smoke mm -hmm. pot when they're younger. Um, and, th and this is where there should be more concern and more dialogue, not around the politics of it. Certainly, should people go to jail for having a little bit of marijuana in their pocket? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, that's not my field or yours, uh, and that's not something that we're concerned about as scientists. What we're concerned about is does it actually have detrimental effects, and what can we do to help prevent these detrimental effects from impacting individuals as well as society? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a very, very nice way of differentiating it, and I think that, you know, we can argue, argue about it in terms of social policy and yeah. regulation and the correctional mm -hmm. system. Um, and there's probably a very good argument on many sides in that mm -hmm. regard. Yes. But what's your focus of study is, is this truly potentially risky mm -hmm. for adolescents? Mm -hmm. So we're going to run out of time shortly, but let's use the last few minutes for you to say, what, what do you think? What do you know so far in terms of what are the risks uh, if you're using perhaps even fairly heavily mm -hmm. during the adolescent years? So. What I know from my preclinical pre studies, and in these studies it's important to realize that we control everything uh, down to what the animals do on a daily basis, and so everybody's doing the same thing. And what we found was rather dramatic effects. Um, if you take one group of animals and give them THC, that main psychoactive ingredient, uh, repeatedly, and you give another group a placebo or saline injection repeatedly, uh, what you find is that the cognitive abilities that are known to develop during adolescence uh, do not improve to the same degree in the animals that receive THC. And so, for example, in the control animals, we saw a 30% increase in performance over a year. In the THC animals, we saw a 15% increase. Uh, yep. Almost a 50% yep. reduction. Yep. Uh, and this persisted after, after a period of withdrawal. Uh, and, and that's rather profound. <laughs> Well, it sure is, and can you see changes in the brain? Yes, and so these track with changes in protein levels, mRNA levels, um, and some of these results are still coming out, but uh, it's uh, clearly 
impacting the neural circuits that are responsible for this particular cognitive ability. Uh, we looked at other cognitive abilities as well in brain regions that are very similar. So we looked at one that's dependent on ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Was it impacted? Hmm. So you're seeing a very clear signals that there are risk here, how, how persistent those changes would be over time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's a lot still to learn. Uh, Absolutely. But yeah. at the same time, it seems to me, and I've read some about this, don't know anything like what you do, but it does seem that there are red flags uh, in terms of potential real um, damage that mm -hmm. could be done. Uh, and I think other studies have followed adults later and seen drop in IQ points. Uh, That's right. That maybe have multiple causes, but this could be one of them. Yes. Well, we're out of time at this point, but thank you for just this peek into mm -hmm. a very, very interesting and very important area that you're studying. Um, for those of you watching, uh, if you're able and want to come see and hear more about this on October 10th, um, our symposium will be presenting both this and other really interesting aspects of addictive behavior. So please try to join us then. And Chris, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us again for this program, and we look forward to seeing you next time.